operations, surveillance and undercover operations. As you can see, we, uh, our mission is to disrupt and help dismantle the transnational criminal networks trading in wildlife, timber and fish by collecting evidence and turning it into accountability. So basically we get evidence that we then give to law enforcement to use in criminal cases. So we conduct intelligence-led investigations, we analyse that intelligence, we have the largest intelligence cell of any NGO operating in the wildlife space. We have six full-time criminal intelligence analysts, all former law enforcement analysts, and we have a number of data entry people. Now the data entry people are really, really important because they're the people that input the data into our database that our analysts then analyse. So we have huge amounts of data provided both by open source research and also from law enforcement agencies who give us material and ask us to do the analysis for them. Because in the wildlife crime area, there's very little capacity to do intelligence analysis. So we all talk about intelligence and we all think it's an I2 chart. And I'm sure you've seen those big charts on the walls where, link, where all the networks are linked. That's great, but that's only the first step in the process because law enforcement doesn't have the capacity to target all of those people in that chart. So what you've got to do is go through that data and find the three or four that they can target that has the most impact on that network. And that doesn't matter whether it's the US, Australia, France, uh, Uganda, South Africa or Vietnam. There's just not the capacity in law enforcement to do this on their own. So that's where we come in to, uh, to help them there. So we take that information, we turn it into intelligence, we then use it in our investigations where we collect more information which is turned back into intelligence or evidence and we feed that to law enforcement and other partners. And our work is transnational so that's where we, this is where we're working and the type of crimes that we're working on. So as you can see there we, we're working, uh, there's a lot of work there with the African Asian nexus. So pangolin, ivory, rhino horn, we're really focusing in on those crime types in the wildlife crime space. Our latest success was working with Nigerian Customs where we facilitated the seizure of 7.3 tonnes of pangolin scales and 800 kilos of ivory about a month ago. Now those networks are still operating, but we know how they're operating and we know where they're operating. So we expect more arrests really soon. A couple of weeks before that, we facilitated the arrest of Davi Grunewald in South Africa with 43 kilos of rhino horn. Now Davi had been operational for 10 years. He'd been on bail for the same sort of crimes for 10 years. And it was through our undercover work, working closely with SAPS and law enforcement in Mozambique that facilitated that, that arrest. But it's not just about arrests. Because if you're coming from a law enforcement background, you know that arrests are just the start of the process. Arrests are nothing without convictions. Seizures without arrests and convictions mean nothing. It's a small financial impact on the organisation, but it doesn't disrupt the network. They just go out and buy more product. So when we're talking Nigeria, it's 35,000 US per tonne for pangolin scars. Now that tonne of pangolin scars in Vietnam is worth 220,000 US. All right, so even if you lose two or three shipments, you're making enough money in Vietnam to, to compensate for the loss of those shipments. So since about 2016, we've facilitated, it's now 153 arrests. And from those arrests, those matters that have been finalised at court, we have a 100% conviction rate. And we have a 100% conviction rate because we get overwhelming evidence against the suspects. There is nothing better than a suspect talking on a video call showing you the product. It makes it really hard for him to get out of that at a trial. It's the same in any, any crime type. The police collect evidence, overwhelming evidence, particularly that of the suspect talking about the crime or participating in the crime, and invariably those matters get dealt with by a plea at court and most of our matters go down exactly the same way. As you can see there, a lot of work in Southeast Asia and a lot of work in Southern Africa. But we're also now increasing our focus in Central Africa and also South America.
a very short video. With NGOs, there's always a video. This one will only be a couple of minutes. It finishes with a really good tackle. Now, we first started looking at this network in 2016. But this guy was smart very smart. There were a couple of things he did, which I won't say here, that made it really hard for us to, uh, to affect his arrest. So one leopard cub from this guy. He wanted 12,000 US for it. Took two law enforcement agencies and NGO to to pull this arrest off. WJC, UCs, US Fish and Wildlife, and the Royal Thai Police. As a result of this arrest, we were given two telephones by the Royal Thai Police, and they asked us could we do the analysis for them to present at court. To give an understanding of the scope that's sometimes involved in these arrests, even though it's only one leopard cub, on one trafficker's phone, there was 110,000 voice and text messages in three languages on three applications, on WhatsApp, on Messenger, and online. Now, every one of those messages and voice messages has to be read or transcribed. There were 50,000 photographs of wildlife and wildlife products from about 33 countries. This guy had over 8,000 contacts on Facebook. There was 5,000 videos. 119 of those videos were different primates offered for sale. Orangutan, uh, chimpanzee, all different types of primates. On the phone were voice messages from couriers who had been bringing turtles, and turtles into Thailand and leopards out of Thailand, saying that they'd arrived safely. The movement of the funds, the photograph of dead animals that hadn't made the, the, uh, the trip, including leopard and orangutan. So this was an eye into a network that had been operating that we knew of for five years. Now it's taken one analyst and one data entry operator eight months full time to do the analysis of that phone. Now we've done three evidentiary certificates for the police, so all of the conversations and messages pertaining to the sale of the leopard but also other examples that they can use to prove that we, this was not the WJC acting as an agent provocateur, but this guy was a, a criminal that had been operating for several years. So any undercover work, the first thing that we do is we make sure that the people that we're targeting are actually involved in criminality, because we don't target innocents. We only target the unwary suspects. So this guy, 110,000 messages the vast majority of them pertaining to illegal wildlife trade. So on that one phone is probably five years worth of work for a law enforcement agency. Because the power of intelligence is not that you'd look, you only look forward, but you also look back. There is evidence on that phone, evidence that can be used against the suspect and the people identified on the phone for as long as the, the statute of limitations apply. So in some countries, that's 10 years. That means you can go back 10 years into the, into the evidence and intelligence to look for a case that you can charge this individual with. One other thing that we also do is we actually work on intelligence products and we hand them to law enforcement agencies. So not only do we facilitate arrests, but often they'll come to us with a whole heap of data and ask us, can we do the analysis for them? Now obviously this is a short term fix because we don't want to be there forever doing this for a law enforcement agency. So it's really important that we focus on capacity building in the area of intelligence analysis or that we work with our partners such as UNODC and other NGOs to start training and most importantly mentoring people on intelligence analysis. Look, we've been training, prior to working for the WJC, I worked for UNODC as the, the um, senior uh, what do they call it? Training uh, advisor in Southeast Asia. So training law enforcement agencies. We've been training law enforcement agencies since 2010 
on how to address wildlife crime. We've only just started mentoring law enforcement agencies on how to address wildlife crime. The only way for this to be sustainable is that, law that the law enforcement agencies take over that role and do it themselves. Because we don't want to be around forever, they need to step up and, and take on the, the responsibility themselves. But to do that, they need training, they need equipment, and they need money. For example, going to court costs money for them to just drive to the court. We recently did an investigation in Southern Africa with a law enforcement agency that didn't have any petrol for their vehicles. So we pay for the petrol to facilitate an arrest. But there's lots of different things we're doing in the wildlife space that's also relevant to, uh, to the oceans. When we, when we look at a criminal supply chain, we look for weaknesses within that supply chain. Those individuals that you can take out which will have the most impact on that criminal network. And to be honest, there's not that many. We, like if you look at poaching networks, there's always going to be networks running out into Kruger National Park, taking rhino horn or elephant ivory because there's a market for it. So it's very difficult to stop all of those poaching incursions. Right, there's lots and lots of assets and time spent on that. Protected area management is really hard, particularly when you're protecting an area the size of Israel. But there are only three or four consolidators of those rhino horn in Mozambique. They're the three or four people you want to take out. Because you take those three or four people out, you might be able to poach the horn, but you have trouble then selling the horn. And that's when law enforcement can bring in undercover people acting as the, the consolidators to take out those on the ground poaching coordinators. And we see very similar uh, opportunities in fisheries crime. Now we've worked with a number of law enforcement agencies on the ground in the fisheries area already providing undercover and surveillance support. So the one thing as an NGO that we can do is we can operate in areas where other traditional law enforcement agencies may struggle. And we've been able to do that really successfully using women. So we actually have more women working on the ground doing undercover work at the moment than we have men. And they're very, very effective. So the people that took down Darby Grunewald were two young women. They might have been across the old Australian talking to them and telling them what to say, but the face of that investigation were two women. And for surveillance, women are by far the best. And we've been able to utilise them for the last five years to get incredible evidence of criminal association and, uh, and basically crooks sitting there talking about what they're doing, oblivious to the two young ladies recording them at the next table. And we've already applied that to the fishery space and it works. And the reason why it works in fisheries, the same way why it works in wildlife crime, is because you often hear people talking about organised crime and wildlife crime. Well, with, with very few exceptions, it's not organised crime. It's disorganised crime. It may meet the definition of organised crime under UNTOC, but the people doing it have very poor tradecraft. They use the same phones. They meet in the same restaurants. They're unaware of surveillance. They don't fact check undercovers. Things that a drug dealer would naturally do at your local street level, none of the major players in wildlife crime do. That's how we've been able to sit down with probably 50% of the top ivory and rhino traffickers in the world and, just, and talk business because they're not true criminals in the sense that you would think of when you discuss organised crime, which is good and bad, obviously. It's good because it gives you opportunities to arrest them, but it's bad because when they do get arrested, organised crime will come into the wildlife crime space and the fishery space. Now, there are exceptions to that, and I know people are going to say, well, the Mafia is involved in, in uh, the Mediterranean, and well, they are. You know, so they've obviously seen a business opportunity and moved into that business opportunity. But most of the illegal wildlife trade is not run by organised crime. Contrary to what a lot of other people will tell you, primarily to get some funds. But it's more about disorganised crime and individuals working together. There's no mafia. There may be some Chinese triads or people who have triad affiliations involved in organised crime but they've been in, in country a long time and were doing other crime types and moved into it for a business opportunity. But even these guys are not your 
say, Chinese-based organised crime. Now, if we looked at organised crime in China, I'll touch on this clam uh, shell uh, report in a second. Of all the, the nations that are actually combating IWT at the moment, China is by far the most effective. They have smashed organised crime in China. And they don't just arrest one or two people, they take out whole networks. Now we've even seen the Chinese starting to extend out into Africa and Asia and target Chinese operating there. The US Fish and Wildlife has also moved into this space. So in 2015 and 2016, there were no heavy hitters working in wildlife crime. Now we have the US and China working, and they're both very, very effective because they collect evidence that's used in court, they collect it ethically, and the, and the whole legal framework process is, is transparent in, in respect to the wildlife crime offences. So we've seen major networks taken out in China and the Vietnamese uh, move up to take their place. So now primarily in Africa, it's major Vietnamese networks that are operating and doing most of the criminality. There'll still be the, the occasional Chinese person that's present because they've been there for a while. But those that went back to China at the beginning of COVID have been stuck there and the Vietnamese have stepped up. Which is good for us because we've been working in Vietnam since 2015 and have a really good understanding of the criminal networks there. So just to, to get on to what I'm supposed to be talking about, uh, which is how to use intelligence to target um, fisheries crime, We've just finished uh, uh, some research into the giant clam uh, shell trade. So 13 seizures in the Philippines since 2019. So 120,000 tonnes combined weight, estimated US 83 million. So anyone out there have any ideas of why criminal networks are targeting clam shells? Trying clam shells? Any ideas? Bet you didn't think you'd be asked a question. Louder. I need to hear the question again. Another one? Okay, anyway. That, that young lady there? They're targeting. The shell is you. Yeah, you, you have to sort okay. of just. The shell yell. is used as decoration. Can't hear. Huh? Decoration. Yeah, absolutely. But what happened in China in 2016? Ivory trade ban. The Chinese have shut down the ivory trade in China. Giant clamshells are a substitute for ivory. So what we're seeing is organised crime moving away from a commodity because that supply path's been blocked into another commodity. So one of the things we've noticed working in wildlife is you never target the commodity. You target the networks. Because the guys that are dealing in pangolin now were the same guys dealing in ivory before the ivory ban. Right? And they'll also deal in tiger or lion or rhino, whatever they can get their hand on that's in demand. Because at the moment, ivory in China is not in demand because everyone's worried about being arrested with it. I can't emphasize enough the role that the Chinese have played in cracking down on the networks in China. It's not talked about much, but we, we absolutely see it out in the trade. So what do the criminal networks do? They move to something that substitutes as ivory. So we've had 46 seizures in China since 2016. 96 cases involve small retail level. So at the moment, the ASB, Chinese ASB hasn't moved up to start looking at these networks at the same level that they have with the ivory networks. But they do collect intelligence and I'm sure that they will move on to them uh, as this develops. But it's just not China, it's also Japan. Because those countries that have an ivory market also have a market for products that substitute as ivory. So we saw lots of uh, mammoth ivory coming out of the Far East. We also saw walrus ivory, all being used as substitutes for elephant ivory. 
So, and there's also an active carving industry still there. Lots of the Chinese carvers moved. What we saw with ivory is we saw the displacement of, uh, of carvers and networks out of China into the greater Mekong. So 2019, I think it was, we found a, a factory in Cambodia, or 2020, a factory in Cambodia that was using computers to print up ivory pendants. The trade had moved, and the Chinese tourist trade had moved to Cambodia, and that's where the ivory was being sold at a retail level. And you'll see that that corresponds with the number of ivory shipments that were seized in Cambodia in 2019. So the one thing with organised crime is it displaces to where it can operate the most easily. Which is why we saw ivory move from East Africa, because pre-2019 Mombasa was figured in nearly every major seizure, to Nigeria. So the networks moved because it was hard to do work in, in Kenya. They moved to Nigeria where it was easier for them to export the products. Our analysis of the giant clam trade has shown a number of gaps, and that's always the case, particularly for an NGO, because you don't get access to all the data. But even law enforcement can't get access to all the data because the systems are so disparate and they don't talk to each other. And we all know that law enforcement operates in silos anyway. So African law enforcement rarely talk to Asian law enforcement. There are differences, of course, but it's difficult to get a team from China and fly them to South Africa, even though it happened recently. Um, these are, at, these are not the norm. So lots of silos in respect to, to law enforcement and a massive failure to share intelligence across the whole supply chain. There's no single database that you, if you're a police officer or a customs officer, can type into and find intelligence about someone in South Africa if you're sitting in Thailand. That intelligence is just not there. You have to go through Interpol and they may or may not have it because that depends upon that law enforcement agency sharing that data. And that's where NGOs like the WHC come in, uh, come in handy because often law enforcement will come to us and ask, do you know these guys? And we'll have at least two or three inquiries a week where law enforcement agencies will ask us whether we're aware of a criminal network. Another area that we're really interested in focusing because we've seen it in wildlife crime is crime convergence. Now with fisheries, there's been a lot of talk about crime convergence. So sharks and illicit drugs. So Operation Apex, the five-year US fish and wildlife investigation, looking at shark fin coming out of Mexico and going to Hong Kong, one of those shipments also contained cocaine. There's also drug traffickers involved with the, the people moving the shark fin, and more importantly, those moving the money. Overloading in illicit drugs, particularly in South Africa. Lots and lots of examples there of, uh, of organised crime groups taking over the drug trade also involved in, in abalone. And it's quite a violent trade in South Africa as well. And fish and human trafficking. So Myanmar, people dying, being killed on fishing boats, being kept there for years without being paid. Fishing boats never returning to shore. That's all been documented. And these are areas where wildlife crime actually re represents the easiest entry point for a law enforcement agency. So you've got a guy that's dealing drugs. He's used to dealing with drug dealers. So he's much more cautious of who he deals with. But if he's also dealing wildlife, he's used to dealing with people who are not really from a traditional crime background. And that's where law enforcement can find their entry point. Because they can come in buying the wildlife, which is a lot cheaper often than the drugs, and then develop uh, enough evidence there to work in either move other UCs into the drug trade or you collect it uh, you know, through the surveillance that you're doing anyway. Intelligence analysis helps identify trends, map the criminal networks, identify targets, and provide new investigative leads. Now, go back to the telephone, 110,000 messages, 8,000 contacts. If we gave that to the Royal Thai Police, they wouldn't really know where to start. Now, with 8, 000, sorry, 110,000 messages, who do you think was the number one person the suspect messaged? His wife. So take about 6,000 messages out of that. But it's the same. We go through the phone analysis looking for the most frequently called numbers. Because why is the wife important? 
The wife's important because if the suspect drops his phone, you look at the wife's records and the husband's going to be ringing her 6,000 times. So that's how you get his new phone number. All right, so you identify when he makes his calls. You know, does he make his calls late or does he make his calls early? Is he busiest during the middle of the day or is he busiest at night time? Because all these are important if you're going to put surveillance assets on someone. What time does he go to bed? So what's his last phone call? And what cell tower is he pinging off? You know, where does he wake up in the morning and what cell tower is he pinging off? So his first call is usually when he wakes up. Or she. Could be she. When they wake up. So if he's pinging off a different phone tower than the one when he went to bed, depending on where the towers are, may mean that he's talking, he's doing his last transaction somewhere and then putting his head down. Or he has a girlfriend or a boyfriend. All of these things are really, really important when you're developing lifestyle patterns for someone, particularly if you want to look at anti-money laundering, which is really not done in the wildlife crime space. Despite the fact that it's been pushed for the last 10 years, there are very, very few successful cases of, uh, of what, uh, people going after the money in respect to wildlife crime. Thailand would be one. An intelligence-led response is the way that law enforcement agencies address serious organised crime. It's the same way they need to address wildlife crime and fisheries crime and timber crime. Use the same tools that we use to follow a drug dealer or a terrorist to follow someone who's making millions of dollars pillaging our natural resources. They're all criminals and they're all in it for the money. So moving from, uh, you know, finishing up from the WJC's perspective, moving from wildlife crime into fisheries crime with the same intelligence-led response or approach is not only logical, but we've seen that it works. We've been able to map networks from importer to wholesaler all the way down to retailer in fisheries crime. Because like wildlife traffickers, they're not looking for someone following them. They have zero awareness of their surroundings. Really poor tradecraft. Whereas drug criminals, for example, are very conscious of their surroundings. We'll do anti-surveillance as, as if it comes naturally. We've never had anyone do anti-surveillance in five years of wildlife crime. That includes buying up to one tonne of ivory, uh, 43 rhino horns. There's no anti-surveillance. It was just focused on getting the money. So we hope that we can move forward in the next five years working in, in the fisheries area, supporting law enforcement and other NGOs who are already there. Thanks for taking the time out, folks, to listen to my presentation. More than happy to answer your questions as long as they're not hard. Uh, and, you know, we don't stay here for too long. But, um, no, seriously, more than happy to answer any questions if they're there. Thank you. Uh, my question, I guess, is I think you made it clear that it's usually agencies. Uh, can you hear? Yeah. I think you made it clear that it's usually agencies within a country that come that approach you to to make a decision on species. So is that what what has been, I guess, why you focus on those species in particular? Look, it's a it's a, a number of uh, reasons. So. Um, our own intelligence analysis tells us where the trade is, is going or where the, the, the suspects are focusing. So we'll also move to that, to that area or we'll get requests from law enforcement. So it's what we're seeing in the trade through okay. our analysis. So in 2021, there were several reports about the ivory trade moving to Nigeria from Eastern Africa. We identified that in 2019 and put out a report highlighting that fact. We were already in Nigeria for two years because that's where the criminals had moved. So, but also, likewise, in respect to what they were trading. So that the African traffickers were still moving ivory out. Mm -hmm. They were pushing ivory out while there's still money in it to push out. But at Vietnam, at the Vietnam end, they were burying the ivory because they couldn't sell it in China. They were still buying it because it was cheap. And they hoped that at some stage they could sell it. But the, the Africans were pushing it out and the Asians were buying it at a cheap price and then burying it in Vietnam. So, to answer your question, a combination of both. Law enforcement, but also our intelligence analysis. Thank you.
it just means that I would really like to talk to you afterwards about sharks and shark fins. Okay, cool. Um, hello. I wanted hello. to ask, how deep do your field investigations go? So I know that you said you co you supplement information or complement the open source and um, enforcement agencies' information with investigations, women operators. Uh, but how deep does it go? Like uh, especially in areas with bad security, uh, areas that are difficult to reach. What are your limitations? Uh, it goes to sitting down with the major traffickers in a Michelin restaurant. Like, so you go where they go, or we bring them to us. So there are obviously limitations in relation to security, but we also replicate what criminal networks are doing. So if you're a major Asian trafficker, we work on a threat level of one to five. So a five is a Pablo Escobar, and a one is a poacher. If you're a level four or five, you don't go to a level two. You come to us. You want to do business with us, you come to us. So in respect to that, face-to-face -face interactions, we've had several thousand with traffickers, let alone talking on the phones. But when we deploy a team, we have a cover team. So we don't just send one guy or girl out into the field and say, go forth and conquer. We put a team around them. We have a case officer who is there to, to look at the security of that UC. So looking at all the variables. And if the, if the case officer is not happy, it doesn't go ahead irrespective of what the field or the team leader thinks at the time. So we have between four and six people on the ground to protect that UC. They also do surveillance of the, of the, uh, the suspects up to a meet or counter surveillance of the UC away from a meet. We clean them off, we dry clean them and run them through a number of choke points to make sure we're not being followed. So, you know, depending on, the, on where it is, you know, we've operated in some pretty hairy areas in Southern Africa and, and Central Africa. Asia, anywhere, um, and it's at it's actually meeting the, the operative, meeting the targets, citing the product, uh, and then calling in a law enforcement response. Does that answer your question? Yeah, look, we we often, you know, obviously we prefer to go in with top cover. So working for a law enforcement agency. But for the first two years, we operated without law enforcement agencies knowing who we were in, in some fairly heavy countries. So, you know, depending on, um, uh, on, the, on the situation, the individual situation of, of, the, of the job would dictate where we go. So obviously cheetah trafficking up through there, that's, you know, we would manage that if we were to target some of those guys. And, you know, the, the other thing is we don't have to go face to face. We, we can use a cutout or, and, and do it remote. With COVID, we've still managed to facilitate I don't know, 30 arrests without being able to travel. So we, and, and actually the, the evidence we get is better because we have face to face calls which are recorded, right, which is great evidence. And depending on the jurisdiction we're in, if it's one person knowledge of the, you know, one person party consent or one party consent, because often different jurisdictions have different laws around the collection or the covert collection of evidence. So we always operate within the laws of that jurisdiction. So in South Africa, we get what's called a 252A to work with the South African police so that any calls we make are evidentiary. So we would look at what the laws are in Somalia in respect to covert recordings or the jurisdiction we're making the call from. So if it's the US and we're working with Fish and Wildlife, it's, it's the it, one party consent. So that, that call is admissible. So we, we often would then tailor our approach around, you know, because we have quite a few undercover operatives spread across the globe and we can move people around to collect that evidence lawfully. Because the other thing we do is we actually go to court and testify if we have to. So not only do we collect the evidence, we'll go to court and testify about that collection. So, you know, that's obviously a major plus for a law enforcement agency if you've got an NGO that's prepared to pay their way, but then come to court and give evidence as well. Um, thank you very much, Steve, for this super interesting presentation. I'm with the International Fund for Animal Welfare. 
I don't really have a question. I merely have um, a remark. I want to emphasize something you said about the effectiveness of the, the Chinese law enforcement system. We, we have the same um, experience. We have an office in China and um, we are accredited by the Chinese government and we do work with them a lot. And a lot of organizations in the Western world where we are now don't understand how effective they actually are. Obviously, there's a lot of problems in China and that is partly because there are so many people in such a large landmass. Yeah. But the way that they have been handled in the past couple of years is really remarkable and we need to really acknowledge that fact. So thank you for saying it and I just want to emphasize that. Thanks, mate. And look, uh, uh, the other important thing to mention here is we're not operating on our own. There are other NGOs out there that are doing a fantastic job as well. And, what, and I4 being one of them. And one of the things that we keep saying and reinforcing is that if you're going after a criminal network, you need a network to defeat it. You can't operate in one country or in a silo and expect to take out a network that's operating in 12 countries and can move tomorrow if they sense that there's a law, a law enforcement um, response. You have to work globally and you have to work as part of a network. I4 being one, there's several other NGOs, NIGOs, UNODC, Interpol, that are all trying to achieve the same goal. And we work often as part of a greater coalition to target these networks. Any other questions? Nope, okay. As I said, thanks guys for your time. I know it's hot. I really appreciate the fact that you hung around for the presentation. If you've got any other questions, just reach out to us. More than happy to help where we can. Um, and look, yeah, have a great time at IUCN. Thank you very much.